Good morning. For those of you I have not met, my name is Kondo. I get to serve as one of the pastors here at, at Mission Point. And this morning, I have the privilege of starting a three-week conversation um, called Stretch. And in this conversation, we simply want to together um, process what we believe the Lord is calling us and inviting us into as a church in 2018. I, I, I hope that whether you are limping in or leaping in to 2018, that you are stepping into this new year with some sense of anticipation. And if for no other reason but the fact that God is not a hoarder, God only keeps what he intends to use. So the very fact that you woke up this morning and are breathing his air is heaven's not so subtle way of letting you know God's not done with you yet. He still has some use for you. He still has things he wants to do in you and things he wants to do through you. And that in and of itself should be caused to step into this year with at least a little bit of anticipation. But for us as a leadership team at Mission Point, we are leaping into this year full of anticipation, leaning over the ledge, uh, looking forward to what the Lord is wanting to do in us and what the Lord is wanting to do through us. And we want to spend the next three weeks just kind of talking about what some of that is and, and inviting you to join in and be uh, a part of that. And in order to do that, in order to have this conversation, we want to look at a really dynamic story um, in Matthew chapter 17. The story is often referred to as the transfiguration of Jesus. And I trust that that semi-big word will make more sense as we look at the story together. But part of what we believe the Lord is, is calling us to do as a church is to ready ourselves, um, to be a prepared movement that he can launch into the work that he's calling us to. Um, if you have a copy of the scriptures, uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 17, the first book of the New Testament, chapter 17. We'll start reading at verse 1 and work our way into this story. Um, Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse number one. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, we're going to have uh, the verses up here on the screen. If you don't own a copy of the Bible, we would love to get one into your hands. Uh, please allow us the privilege of giving you a belated Christmas gift. So if you don't own a Bible, please head to the Connection Corner right out these doors um, after the service and just ask for one. We'll get it to you. It's God's Word. It's living and breathing. It will change you forever and would love uh, to be engaging His Word together. Um, Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse 1. We're going to jump right into this incredible story. It says, verse 1, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves. Okay, so um, this story starts, and um, man, it comes out of the gates, and it threatens to be an epic, incredible story, and then it just tanks. It just goes south for me right here in verse number one. I mean, it starts with so much promise, the matchless Jesus, Lord of the universe himself. Group text to three of his friends, and he said, boys, let's go on a trip, spend some man bonding time together, have some hearts to heart. And if I'm one of these three guys, I'm like, uh, yes, count me in. That sounds good. You are Jesus. Let's do this thing. And then Jesus says, awesome. I'm heading right over. It's a camping and hiking trip, and uh, I'm out. I'm out. Right away, this is not a good story anymore. It was almost good until Jesus started talking about hiking up a mountain. Now, historians argue because historians love to do that, but it's most likely that the mountain being referred to here is Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon stood 9,000 feet high, 9,000 feet above sea level. And this is where Jesus <laughs> wanted to do the whole camping bear grills thing with his disciples. Now, 
if you want to be my friend and you want to spend time with me, take me to a game in Indianapolis. I'll love you forever. If you want to ruin our friendship, then invite me to go rock climbing with you up a few thousand feet. I will not like you when we get back. We probably won't be friends when we get back. My quads burning won't thank you. My burning lungs won't thank you. There'll be nothing good about that story. And so when I read this and they start to go camping 9,000 feet, I'm out. It was almost a good story. You know, then it occurred to me, <laughs> I wonder if, if this isn't maybe a little part of my problem, and I started to wonder, I wonder if this isn't maybe even a little part of our problem um, in, in, in some sense or another. I wonder if this isn't, to some degree or another, why we often miss out on the glorious adventures that Jesus himself is calling us into. See, because if I'm to be honest with you, I want to be close to Jesus. Um, I want to be tight with Jesus. I want to spend some time with Jesus. I want Jesus to invite me into this glorious adventure, and I want Jesus to reveal himself to me, and I want him to show me things that he has in, in store for me, and I want it to be awesome, and I want to see the majestic views he has for me. I want those mountain experiences with Jesus uh, Christ himself. I just want them to be at Starbucks. <laughs> and I know I'm not the only one, if we're to be honest, here for a while. Jesus, show me all you have for me, and take me to these epic and majestic places, but please don't require me to have to do any work or for there to be any burn in the process. I want to see majestic views from sea level. And as, as Matthew starts telling us this story, it's almost as if there's the hint of what we know as we study the rest of the scriptures. If you're going to be close to Jesus, and if you're going to get in on all that he has for you, then many times it's not going to be a walk in the park. It's going to be more like a hike up a really high mountain that will hurt at times. It will burn at times. You will want to turn back at times. It will make no sense at times. It will feel like Jesus hates you at times and is punishing you for something. Because what kind of a friend invites you to a ninth? thousand foot mountain hiking experience. Well, maybe the kind of friend who knows that the views get more glorious the higher you go. Verse 2, it says, there on this mountain, he, Jesus, was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun." And his clothes became as white as light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus. I can imagine Peter like, this was totally worth it, you guys. I told you, I told you this was so worth it. When they reached like 9,203 feet to be exact, they experienced the single most heart epic moment they ever had to their life in their life to that point. Jesus kind of peels back his earthly veil for a minute. He, he pulls back his human disguise and he allows his glory to break through for a moment. And these guys are instantly flooded with joy unimaginable. Because another thing we know when we study the scriptures is that the soul was intended to thrive in its natural habitat, which is the glory of God itself. And now here they are basking in this moment where the glory of Jesus peeks through his human veil. Their hearts are absolutely burning. Now, to be clear, these guys are just now reaching 
for words to describe what they saw because they'd never seen anything like this. So they're just doing the best they can to try and describe what they can see and what they're experiencing. And that's how it often is with Jesus. He would do things and show you things and you're just going to be reaching for words, just winging it, making things up. Hey, it was, it was kind of like he looked like the sun and his, his clothes looked like all Cloroxy and it's super bleached and, and very white. We don't know what to tell you. It was just unbelievable. And then while they're still trying to absorb this whole Jesus pulling back the mask thing, uh, it says that out of nowhere, Moses and Elijah join Jesus and they're chopping it up on the mountain. Moses and Elijah are dead. And so here's the sixth sense thing that's happening for them right here on the mountain. And they had grown up hearing Moses and Elijah's name spoken in these reverent and hushed tones. Because Moses, he was the guy who God used to emancipate the Israelites from captivity in Egypt. And he's the one who God handed the, the, the tablet with the inscribed commandments on them. That, that Moses. And now here he is standing right here, a little shorter than I imagined, but there he is nonetheless. And Elijah, he's there too. He's the guy who we heard he never even died. He just got shuttled. He just got, sh you know, chauffeured up to heaven in a chariot of fire. And now here they are having a mountaintop conference. You can imagine these guys are like, oh my goodness, that was totally worth it as they experience something unimaginable. Glory of Jesus peeled back, and they can see it for a moment. The burn, so worth the breakthrough. As I was thinking about this story, um, it was so striking to me in how many ways this story mirrored Mission Point Community Church's 2017. Um, some of you remember, but many of you may not, that as last year crested, as we started 2017, there was just this deep sense that 2017 would be a defining year for us um, as a church. We just knew it. We knew the Lord was whispering that last year was, was going to be a year in which we would be standing on the brink of breakthrough. On a personal level and on a corporate level, we just knew that this was going to be a year in which walls that had kept us from stepping into places the Lord had for us would bow. They would crumble. We just had the, the distinct sense that obstacles that stood in the way of us seeing some of the views he had for us would be moved and that there would be breakthrough and he would allow us to move forward in certain and compelling ways. Um, we knew as a leadership team that last year was a year the Lord was wanting to bring us into the next frontier of our um, ministry as a church. And um, man, we wanted it all. We wanted every single scoop of every single thing that he had for us. We wanted every single obstacle to be broken. We wanted every wall to fall. We wanted to see all he had for us. We wanted to enter into whatever the frontier was that we sensed that he was inviting us into. We wanted to see the views, but I don't think I fully expected it to be a 9,000 foot kind of year. I mean, we wanted breakthrough. I can speak for myself. I wanted breakthrough, and I had a great expectation of what the Lord would do, but I was kind of hoping he would just kind of hand it to us. But no, he showed up and said, let's go hiking. Let's go climb some rocks. And I'm not going to lie to you, 2017 Burned, y'all. Mm. Uh, turned out to be by far the most painful year that we have experienced um, as a church. Um, and you can ask any of our full time leadership team, and they'll tell you our lungs burned. 
And our team didn't know if we could handle any more. Because our church continued to grow. But our staff did not proportionally do the same. Which meant that for a number of us, we just continued to take on more and more and more and do more and more and more and more and more until we wondered, are we going to break? We were on the brink of exhaustion. Men... It burned. And I don't think they'll mind me saying this, but you can ask the elders and they'll tell you. um, It was the most taxing and tiring and dare I say tense year we have ever had. We loved each other as brothers, but there were moments we genuinely did not like each other. As we try to figure out what does it look like to love and lead this movement that you have entrusted to us. And we could feel the enemy just pushing with all of his might, pushing us towards the brink of division. It was a tough year. It was almost like the devil, Woo! it's almost like he knew that we were inching towards that 9,000 foot place where the clouds part and we start to see what the Lord has for us and things break and they start to shift and he didn't want that and it was a burn of a year as we continued to move towards what we believed the Lord was saying to us. And can I say, by the way, thank you. Uh, Man, thank you to those of you, the army of you who just continued to volunteer and to serve and to use your gifts to help carry the load. Thank you. You never know what that does for a a movement, what that does for the church as the church continues to move forward. And thank you to those of you who prayed. Some of you probably woke up in the middle of the night and no idea why you were praying for us as a team or praying for us as a church. And some of you even sent notes just to affirm the fact that, hey, Lord has put you on my heart and we've been praying for you. Thank you for the ways that you prayed us through. Because can I report And man, we got to 9,000 feet, and um, even as I sit here, I'm still reveling in some of the things the Lord allowed us to see that we never thought we would see as a church. As he peeled back the veil on a number of things, and he moved certain obstacles, and we started to see and started to experience things that made our souls burn with incredible joy. And what I'm saying is 2017 may have burned in the painful sense. But as the Spirit seems to have been whispering to us, it was also a year in which we just experienced breakthrough in a number of key ways. And some of those ways may not sound epic, but we understood how key these things were as we move forward as a church. And 2017 ended up being the most beautiful year yet. Because the burn and the breakthrough don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive. Now I'm talking to some of you who are in a season of waiting, and some of you are in a season of struggle, and some of you who are in a season of working with your teenagers, and you don't know if you can take any more. Some of you who are walking those hard places where the Lord has called you to continue to go, and you're wondering if you can take any more. This is just for you to be reminded that the the burn precedes the, the breakthrough. Don't quit on whatever it might be. Ended up being the most incredible year yet as we saw glimpses that we would never have seen if we had stayed at sea level or quit when it burned. Crazy thing. I would like to remember the love up that we did at some point last year um, in which, no joke, over 200 of you of your own free accord, we didn't make you do it of your own free accord agreed to this. You agreed to go out of our comfort zone into our community and canvas neighborhoods and go door to door knocking on strangers doors and saying hey can we just pray the peace of God for you. Do you remember that? Do you remember, by the way, how your quads burned as you walked up to those doors? Like, God, can we please have impact on our community without running the risk of coming across like we're crazy people? 
And yet he continued to lead us. And many of you stepped into those spaces. And I wish that we had time to tell you the stories we've heard of the way things change. We would even just be on social media randomly and hearing what shifted in the lives and the homes of people in our community because your crazy people took the hike and stepped in and the Lord peeled back our self-consciousness, and then started to peel back the darkness in our community. And we got to experience that. One of my favorite moments last year was um, our orphan Sunday, as the Lord just peeled back our hearts, and over 400 of you said, we refuse to do nothing while 140 million orphans in our world struggle. So we may not be able to do everything, but we can all do something, and 400 plus of you said, we're going to do our something. Whether it's praying or raking or giving money or, or being a support system, we are going to do something, and the glory of God started to peer through, and the enemy was super frustrated, and we were just enjoying the view as the Lord continued to work in our midst. There was one time when you all heard about people you had never heard about who were in Texas and they were struggling because a hurricane came through and one week and you just gave them $10,000. You don't know these people. As the Lord just broke open your hearts with generosity and pieces of his glory poured through and what an incredible view. And you may not realize the significance, but to heaven, the significance of those moments. And last year, the Lord spoke to me and spoke to us as a leadership team more vividly than he had in years past. Um, even just a number of times we'll be sitting in an elder meeting and an elder be like, the Lord just, you know, laid on my heart this thing. And then the Lord spoke this thing. And he was just super loud. He was very chatty last year. And Man, what an amazing thing for him to peel back the veil on silence and start to speak and allow us to hear what he's thinking and what he's feeling and what he's saying about this house. Pretty awesome. Man, there was, there was a guy who told me that, hey, one Sunday, we're talking about the Holy Spirit or something like that, and at the end of the service, you know, there was a moment where some of the elders were up here and they were, they were praying for people, and this guy went to one of the elders and said, hey, would you pray? And the elder laid a hand on him, and he said, right when the elder laid a hand on me, I felt something pop in my body, and I knew Jesus had peeled back the veil on nature and had healed me of whatever it was that was ailing. I'm like, for real? I don't remember stuff like that happening before him. As the Lord started to shift things and break through some things, and parents are talking about, I laid my hand on my kid, and whatever it was that was oppressing that child just left, and my baby slept in heavenly peace. I'm like, in this church? As we continued to move, and as we continued to hike, and even in some practical ways that will mean probably more to us than it might mean to you, but our staff, our overworked staff, started to experience a little bit of relief as people stepped in and, you know, were able to add a couple of pieces that brought an immense amount of relief and moved the church forward in ways that I don't think we'll fully appreciate for a little while. But the Lord continued to show himself. We as a church continued to grow in a time, by the way, in the United States where the church is on a severe and quick downward spiral, the Lord just continued to grow us. Um, towards the end of the year, we even got to experience a shift in our organizational structure. Now, that might not sound like good preaching to you, but that is something so significant because our church had reached a place where there was a ceiling involved. And the Lord did something that allowed us to break through the ceiling with a change of structure that allows us now to move into the next frontier. I thought the next frontier would look a certain way, but that's not one of the things I pictured. And so now we are literally poised to just move forward in ways we were never able to move forward in years past. 2017 was the most painful year. Our ministry lungs burned. But as we continued to hike by faith, we saw breakthrough and we experienced what we believed he had promised. And oh, the views, church. Oh, the views. And by the way, if you're new at a mission point, welcome. And can I just tell you, you are coming in at 9,000 feet. You are coming in at a great time. And we're so glad. I hope you don't mind the views. Uh, they're pretty amazing. And we are just getting started and looking forward to what the Lord will continue to do. Okay, back to the story. So, 
These guys, um, they're experiencing um, this breakthrough that came after the burn. Um, the views are like pow, and they're just absolutely loving life. And then verse 6, uh, Peter affirms that. He said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. So good. If you wish, I will put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. You can see Peter like the best day ever, Lord. And then right there on that mountaintop, the story takes a tragic turn. And danger breaks into that breakthrough moment, that breakthrough experience on the mountain. Did you see it? Man, it came so quick and it was so subtle. Peter, he says, it's so good for us to be here. Let's build some shelters. Uh-oh. This transfiguration experience, these views, though, this mountaintop moment, this, this breakthrough, this season, it's so amazing. Let's stay here. Let's never leave. In fact, it's so good, uh, let, let's build uh, monuments so we can uh, protect and preserve this moment and keep it for a little while. Danger. Danger. See, because the temptation is always to fall in love with that moment when God showed up and light broke through. And he healed us and he showed himself to us. Last year was an awesome moment in the story of Mission Point. And I'm telling you, if we are not careful, our temptation will be to settle and to stay there. Someone got healed last year. Let's make a video and then we can just play that video over and over and over again. Remember the 35 people who got baptized? Let's try and recreate all of the dynamics of that service so that we can rinse and repeat. Let's just stay here. Remember how the church was growing? Hey, let's build shelters so we can protect and preserve those sacred moments and we can stay here. Because if we start preaching about things like adultery, if we start preaching about things like racism, then, you know, people may not want to hear it and people might leave. So, hey, let's build a shelter and let's keep this moment. Let's preserve. Let's stay. What Peter starts to suggest on that mountaintop is this is so good. Why would we ever want to leave? Why would we ever want to change? Let's settle. The problem is that the church is not a moment deserving of a monument. The church is a movement in desperate need of a mover. What tends to happen is the Lord shows up and he does some incredible things in a church. And a church says, how can we preserve that and keep doing the same thing over and over again? Let's build a monument. But the problem is when you try to monumentalize a movement, the movement begins to die. And that's why many churches will wake up and wonder what happened and why isn't the Spirit moving. It's not that the Spirit is not moving, it's that the Spirit has moved on. But you loved that moment so much and you determined we're going to stay here. And before you know it, stay becomes settle and settle becomes stagnant and stagnant becomes Stuck. If there's any question, 
how God feels about Peter's idea to settle, Peter's idea to stay. And if there's any question about what we believe God would say to us as we start 2018, verse 5 clearly tells us, it's not time to settle, it's time to stretch. Verse 5. While he was still speaking, Peter, that is, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. This is so great. God doesn't even let Peter finish his sentence before he um, interrupts him. Surrounds him with a cloud of glory, which is amazing, by the way, because Peter was probably thinking, oh, there's no way things could get any better than this. And then he's surrounded by glory. It's like, I never saw this coming. There was more. Surrounds him with glory and then makes an announcement. Listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. And this is so key for us to eavesdrop in on and for us to, to listen in on. Listen to Jesus. Peter, it's not about a moment. It's not about a season. It's not about a mountaintop experience. It's not about an epic year of ministry. It's not about the great views. It's not about the growing numbers. It's about Jesus. And you notice God says, this is my son. He doesn't say, this is a moment. I love it. He says, this is my son. I love him. And you all should listen to him. Lest you forget that the very reason you are in this breakthrough moment, the very reason you are watching glory peeled back is because he texted you and told you, we're going on a trip. The reason you're experiencing any of it was because you were listening to him in the first place. And when you start to trade listening to the one who leads us into these adventures for the adventures that he leads us into, and you try and build monuments around the adventure, the movement begins to die. He says, listen to Jesus. That's, by the way, in case anyone was wondering why Moses and Elijah show up. On this mountaintop. This is so great. Uh, look down at verse 7. While Peter and the, and the crew are still freaking out about the glory and, and, and all of the cloud and all of that stuff, uh, Jesus comes and touches them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. Verse 8. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Man, we could have a whole morning and just talk about this scene because this is pretty awesome. This is pretty epic. God is making a statement. See, because Moses, Moses represented the law. Moses represented the Ten Commandments. Moses was a representative of the written word of God. Elijah, he represented the prophets. Elijah represented the spoken word of God, an era in which God would uniquely speak to his people through these men. And it says, uh, the, the three guys looked up, and um, Elijah was gone, Moses was gone, and Jesus was standing by himself. Um, the written word, poof, it's gone. The spoken word, poof, it's gone. And standing all alone on that mountaintop is the living word, Jesus. This is God just saying, listen, I wrote my word, but my written word exists to speak about the living word to Jesus. And here I spoke to you and I still speak to you, but everything I speak about is ultimately speaking about Jesus. It's about him. Listen to him, Peter. It's not about this experience. It's not about that experience. It's not about your baptisms. It's not about your love ops. It's not about your structure. It's not about your staff. It's not about the burn. It's not about the hike. It is ultimately about Jesus. And if the church continues to listen to him, I will continue to carry you into the places that I've intended for you to go. And may I make a declaration here on January the 14th, 2018, that as long as Mission Point is a church, it will always be about loving and listening to and following the lead of Jesus. It is all about him. He says, listen to Jesus. 
listen to Jesus. So Peter's barely digesting all of this when Jesus, his leader, taps him on the shoulder and says, well, that was good. Time to move on. And by the way, if you're not listening to Jesus, you stay stuck. Peter was listening. It's time to move on because that's what movements do. Verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. We would have died in our Instagram culture. I can't tweet this. What? I imagine Peter, as they're going down that mountain, being led by Jesus, is kind of pouting and is kicking rocks and is murmuring to himself, like, move on. Why would we ever move on? from This was awesome, and, and I don't understand why we would move on. And probably just as he's wallowing in that moment, he gets interrupted again. Look down at verse 14. It says, when they came to the crowd at the bottom of this mountain, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or he falls into the water. And I wonder if it happened for Peter then or if it happened for Peter a little bit later. But I'm pretty sure it occurred to Peter. Oh! Huh! We couldn't settle on the mountain because there was still suffering in the valley. We couldn't stay in that epic experience because there's still hurt in the world. And I know, church, Jesus will continue to pull back the veil and give us glimpses of his greatness and give us glimpses of his glory. But as long as there are still desperate dads and as long as there's still hurting kids, as long as there's still lost people in our world, we cannot settle. There's still work to be done. Jesus knew that. And Peter soon discovered it. 2017 was great, but we can't settle because in the valley called Kosciuszko County, there's still nearly 50,000 lives that Satan has successfully kept from experiencing Jesus. And it's all about him. Life is all about him. Freedom is found in him. And there are tens of thousands of people in our own county, in the valley called this county, that desperately need people led by Jesus to go into those dark places. We can't settle because we know that in the valley called our world, there are still 140 million orphans in desperate need of hope and in desperate need of home. We can't settle yet because we know there'll be a day, don't get me wrong, where we will settle and all we will revel in will be glory. But we are not there yet. There is still work to be done. And last I checked, Mission Point was still called to be a movement deeply concerned about what it looks like to take light to those 50,000 in our county and what it looks like for us to join God in seeing the 140 million orphan number obliterated. Because we chose to do something. There is still work to be done. But look at this next part. Because this is what I believe as we start our year, the Lord would want us to dial into. Oh, we're going to work this year. And we're going to get some things done. And we're going to see darkness peeled back. And we're going to see devils flee a little bit as we carry his light. And as we make it about Jesus. But... It's interesting what happens next, because I think the Lord wants to say this to us. I want to stretch you, and I want to grow you, and I want to make you ready. Verse 16, the dad says to Jesus, I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. And Jesus says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? 
how long should I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and the boy was healed at that moment. That's how Jesus rolls. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and they asked, why couldn't we drive it out? Why? He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to here, um, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus, why couldn't we drive back the darkness? Why weren't we seeing impact to the 50,000 in the world around us? And Jesus essentially says to this group of his followers, because you weren't ready you weren't prepared. Um, Matthew records Jesus as saying you lacked faith. But when um, Mark records the same story, he, he records Jesus as saying you lacked prayer. The point seems to be you all rushed into the work, but you weren't ready. You rushed into the work relying on your strategies and relying on yourselves, but you yourselves were not ready. And you cannot rush into the valley unprepared. You cannot enter into the darkness and do the things that I'm calling you to do in this county and in this world unprepared. I want to grow a movement of people who are strong in their love for Jesus. I want to grow people who are dependent on Jesus. I want to grow a movement of people who are listening to Jesus. There was a lack of readiness. And there's this glorious invitation in this. This is not so much Jesus mad at his followers. This is Jesus saying, I have some amazing things for you to do. Let's get ready. Because if you rush into the work unprepared, you will rush into the work unempowered. And you will wonder why aren't we seeing the impact that the Lord is calling us to carry out. And I believe he would say that to us, even as we start this year. I want to see a movement of people who are continually growing and continually being prepared. And so even as this year starts, you're going to hear us talk more about this. Not just that, you're going to see us change some of the ways we do things in order to accommodate a, a movement of people who are continuing to grow together, a, a movement of people who are continuing to grow in, in him. Um, in fact, let me give you a quick glimpse, really quickly, of some of the things uh, that we are looking forward to as we figure out what does it look like, Lord, for us to be stretched in our faith, for us to be stretched in our dependence on you, for us to be stretched in our love for you, so that as we reach into the valley, we see the movement that we believe you've called us to be a part of. And so you, you see a growing emphasis on, on prayer. Um, as elders, we're continuing um, to talk about this, and we are committing uh, to just praying more for you in, in our times together. We are committing to praying more with you. So you notice that, you know, in the coming weeks, we're going to end every service with our elders up here with the opportunity for you to just come and pray with them, whether it's to pray for, for, for coworkers or whether it's to pray for, for healing or whether it's to pray for the salvation of a family member, um, whether it's to pray for something you yourself are struggling with. We want it to be a movement of people who we don't want Jesus to say because you didn't pray up before you walked into the war. And so we want to be a people who are growing in uh, prayer. And so we want to carve out more time even in our experiences to do that. See, the disciples tried to do the work without prayer, and work without prayer is powerless. And we don't want to go into the valley powerless. And so you see more of that. You, you see us emphasizing more care, which is something we're really excited um, about. Um, our elders, again, are definitely committing to, to more intentionally caring for you, our church family, and figuring out what that looks like. Uh, we are so committed to figuring out what it looks like to invite us to care well for each other. Because here's what we understand. If we're not caring well for each other as a family, and yet we want to tell Jesus, we want to go into the valley and care for all of those other people, Jesus will say, you weren't ready. You are missing each other. 
And you're walking by each other and you're not caring well for each other. And so we wanted to figure out what does it look like to connect and care well um, for each other because we believe our reach will not exceed our care for each other. Um, And we're going to invite you to growth, and you're going to see and hear us talk more about this. We'll offer connection groups, as Matt shared, a couple of starting, you know, in the coming um, weeks, because we want to be people who go out prepared. We want to be people who continue to equip a movement so that when we head out there, we know what it looks like to engage in spiritual warfare. We know what it looks like to share the gospel. Otherwise, we're going to be up here saying, hey, we should share the gospel, and there'll be a movement of people saying, how? We're in the valley, but the opportunity came and we didn't capitalize on it because we didn't know how. And we want to see a growth in our readiness so that when those opportunities come, we know how to enter into those. And so you hear us talk about more of those things. Um, We look forward to sharing stories. Stories, by the way, are a great um, way to grow. At the end of most of our our sermon series, we're going to take special Sundays to just have extended time of worship and have you come up here and share stories. What's God doing in your life? Why? Because we don't want to be a movement of people who are just sharing the Word of God but not applying it. So it's so beautiful to hear ways in which the Spirit is moving and people are putting the Word of God into practice and we want to make room for those stories to be heard so y'all will be preaching more in the coming year. Um, And that has such a powerful way of continuing to um, equip and encourage. And um, our staff, you're going to see our staff continue to grow so that we can be better armed to equip, so we can be better armed to care, so we can be better armed to come alongside this movement, to help ready this movement for the work we know the Lord is sending us into, even in this year. If our family is healthy and our family is growing in Jesus, I believe the Lord will stretch our reach and he'll multiply the impact of our work. And so we are so excited about 2018 and we look forward to sharing more of what that means for you. Um, moving forward together, what does that look like for you? And so we'll continue this conversation next week, but it's all about Jesus, and we look forward to growing together in him. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd give us incredible grace. We pray that you would make Jesus our obsession, and that we would long to grow together as a church and to grow in him so that as we go into the valley, into the brokenness, that we would be ready and we would be empowered. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.